Hello, NBC family. I'm so thrilled again that you can be joining us for this online combined service, whether you're tuning in at 9.30 in the morning, 5 at night, or some other time in between. It's great that you've been able to join us this way for what I trust is actually going to be the last of these fully online services. I'll have a little more to say about our return to church next week in a moment. But let me introduce today's uh, service by saying that we're going to be concluding our hot topics that's right, Andrew's going to be preaching for us in just a moment on the question, is God green? That is, is God environmental and how should we as Christians respond to such things? And to get our hearts and our minds focused on God's creation and God himself, we're going to turn once more to the scriptures. So please come with me, if you would, to Psalm 8. Psalm 8, of course, a beautiful psalm that leads us to think about such wonderful truths as who God is, what he has done in all of creation. I trust that by now you've found Psalms and are at Psalm 8 in your Bibles, so please read it along with me. Where David writes, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all the flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Brothers and sisters, I trust that you're looking forward with anticipation to this great topic and hearing Andrew preach it for us. But as we come now, let's uh, join together in prayer. Please, in your homes, join me in prayer. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we do praise you for you are a good and glorious God. This morning and this evening especially, Lord, we praise you that you are the ruler of all creation, that you have established the beauties and wonders of nature in heaven and on earth, all the things that we behold day by day. Lord, we ask that as we come to your word today, you would indeed shape our minds and our hearts once more, that we might best serve you and glorify you in this world. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just as we continue in this service, uh, a couple of announcements for you. Uh, first and foremost, as I mentioned earlier, we are trusting that this is the last of our fully online services. Next week, it is our intention to return to physical gatherings here in the church building. And I know and pray that many of you are very excited and eagerly anticipating that return. Anyone who is unable to join us, however, trust that we will still continue to have a live stream running uh, it will look a little different than these pre-recorded services, uh, but that will certainly be accessible through this YouTube channel, so please make sure you tune into that if you can't physically be here. Speaking of physically being here, a couple of announcements to orient your minds before you do return, and that is that primarily the, the rule we need to abide by here in the church building is the four square metre rule. To that end, we're allowed to have about 120 people in the church building, as well as others on site in other locations. <clears throat> to facilitate our return as best we can, we've made the decision that kids' teaching time will be running throughout the service, but that children will need to be dropped off at the library prior to our service commencing. So children will spend the hour or so of our service in one location, and their parents will spend it here in the church building. That will enable us to ensure appropriate social distancing. Uh, you'll only have entry into the church hall through the front doors where we'll all need to sign in and have our names and numbers recorded uh, in accordance with government regulations and at that same time the opportunity to use some hand sanitizer. We're of course asking anyone who is sick to remain home and utilize the online services rather than being present. Once you actually enter the building, you will be allowed to sit with the members of your household. We've abandoned the spaced out single chairs and we're going to replace it with the four sets of chair, the sets of four chairs. 
And essentially what will happen is your family group will sit together. There'll be a two chair gap before the next family or the next individual sits there. Services, as we understand it, will still unfortunately not have any congregational singing, though of course we'll be utilising songs of praise throughout. And we are asking that everyone only comes to one service. We know there's a, a good number of people who like to come to both morning and evening, but to facilitate the inclusion of everyone in a service, we're asking that those people would pick one and stick with that for the coming season. Um, of course, you have the opportunity to watch the other service online later on or earlier on in that day. And finally, before uh, I conclude this particular announcement, let me urge you, if you are intending to return to church, and we're very excited that you are, please ensure that you arrive early on next Sunday. Uh, I would anticipate that you'll need to be here at 9 o'clock for the 9.30 service or about 4.30 for the 5 p.m. service. Getting everyone in and registered and sorting out some of the kinks in these first couple of weeks is going to take some time. So my urging is to arrive early and come eagerly uh, anticipating what God is going to do. If you've missed any of that, rest assured an email will be coming out shortly with all of these details and a few more so that you can be fully prepared for our return. That's enough of the announcement from me about this. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Right now, though, we're going to hear a, another announcement from Todd about men's ministry, and then we'll have the opportunity to hear an update about Scripture in our local schools. Hi, everyone. I'm in my home. Uh, it's Tuesday morning here in a nice rainy Nowra, and Todd's up in Sydney at a conference, but I've got the opportunity to be joined by Todd. Todd, of course, is one of the regular attendees in our evening service. A number of you would have heard him preach to Romans not long ago, um, and it's a delight to have Todd join me where he is now. Uh, Todd, throughout this year, has expressed interest in men's ministry and, and helping serve our church in that way. He's got an exciting opportunity for the men of the church. So, Todd, if you'd like to share that with everyone, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, well, uh, thanks, Ryan. Um, I hope you're all well, friends. Um, uh, this is uh, a men uh, message for our men. Uh, we have got some exciting news uh, because on the uh, 8th of August, our church will be live streaming the Katoomba based men's convention uh, to kick off uh, men's ministry uh, as we sort of think through that uh, this year and particularly, hopefully, as restrictions lift next year. Uh, so, unfortunately, we can't go to Katoomba, but we can bring Katoomba to you. Uh, so, we're going to meet together in the church building. Uh, it'll run from about 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, we're still working through uh, what and if uh, we can share breakfast together beforehand. Uh, the theme's a great theme, how Jesus changes men for the better. Uh, there's three great speakers, one being Professor John Lennox, a world-renowned apologist and mathematician. Uh, all the info will be in the weekly bulletin, which will be sent out each week, and you can uh, register there and, and uh, find out further information. Uh, but it, it will be a wonderful time of, of fellowship and teaching. Uh, so it'd be great if uh, the guys, if you could lock it into your diary, uh, write it on your calendar, uh, and make it a priority to be there uh, to, to meet together with the other men, to set the lead in our families with the importance of gathering together uh, and to be doing it uh, not just for our sake, but for each other's sake too. Uh, I'm reminded of the words of uh, the writer of Hebrews when he says, uh, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, uh, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, uh, but encouraging one another all the more as we see the day approaching. Uh, thank you. Fantastic. Well, thanks, Todd. And um, yeah, certainly look forward to all of you men joining us for that wonderful live stream Katoomba convention. It's going to be a great event. And as Todd said, uh, keep an eye out for those weekly bulletins where there'll be more information available. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you all there. God bless. Hi again, everyone. Uh, we're going to take an opportunity now to hear from Sue and Bessie. So glad that you could both join us, and I'm sure everyone at home's excited to see a couple of more familiar faces. Uh, 
We're going to be talking a little bit about SRE, that's the Ministry of Scripture in Schools, and we've been very blessed to be joined by two of our current Scripture teachers. They're about to be returning to that wonderful ministry in the very near future, God willing. Uh, one of our guests has been serving in SRE for over 30 years, and the other uh, was about four weeks into her service when COVID struck and is eagerly awaiting the opportunity to return. I'm not going to say which is which, <laughs> and we'll leave a little game for you at home to try and work out who I might be talking about. But it's great um, that you can both be here, and um, yeah, the opportunity to catch up with, with you is, is wonderful. I'm sure all of our people will be encouraged to see both of you. Uh, so how have you both been managing throughout this time of COVID? How are you doing in all of our distancing and separation? Um, hi, church family. It's great to, um, well, not seeing you, but seeing you. Uh, good to see you, Ryan, so thank you. i uh, certainly been missing uh, our church fellowship of a Sunday morning and also our, our weekly um, house church group, certainly, and looking forward to returning to church when it comes back. So that'll be great. Um, I've been reading a few different books through the time, but the one that's really challenged me is about the persecution, persecuted Christians. And I've been reminded and really challenged about how we meet on a regular basis and the fellowship that we have. And, um, and then when, you know, the privilege that we have in doing that, but uh, then you think of the persecuted Christians and how they uh, really struggle and yeah so and sometimes I think we take our church services for, for granted and uh, yeah it's been a, a real uh, challenge and reminder for me to yeah to church so and I'd also like to take this opportunity to, to thank you and Andrew Ryan for um, all the work that you are doing and uh, getting our church services online uh, we've been greatly encouraged and, and your faithfulness is really um, great in teaching the Bible. So yeah, so we thank you. Thanks. We thank God for you and uh, your continuing hard work and all the things that happen behind the scenes we know nothing about <laughs> and haven't seen. So we thank you very much. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege and a pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, You're thank getting you. a bit of insight into the behind the scenes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at yeah, the moment. It's good. So, what, what about you, Bessie? How have you been in this time of not meeting together? Yes. Oh, hi, church. Um, well, I've definitely been missing church and the contact with my friends and family here. Um, I definitely miss the worship time together. That's um, one thing I've really missed uh, being at home. But I've also really enjoyed the intentional family time that we've been able to have. Um, time is to play together and to have fun together and uh, those sort of things that maybe we didn't have as much time for while mm. we were busy with activities. Mm. Um, and But I did want to say that I have been missing all my kids teaching time kids, so special hi to all the NBC kids. Mm. I've been missing you guys. Um, and I've definitely missed the last week where we would have been doing kids club. So that's a bit yeah. sad, yeah. Um, but hopefully we'll get something else maybe later in the year or something, we can do something fun together. So yeah, that's what I've been up to. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Um, so Bessie, what excites you about the imminent return to SRE? Yeah. Um, I'm excited about getting back to see the kids, I'm excited about getting to share with them about Jesus and, and what he's done for us and the hope that we have. Um, and the kids just love us coming along, they are so excited, they are encouraged, they ask us to pray for them um, and that's just so encouraging mm. how much they are accepting and want to be at scripture and hear what we have to say. Um, so yeah, that's what excites me about my return to scripture. Excellent. <coughs> yeah. Well, God willing, it's only a, a week or so away and, and that's a mm, wonderful I opportunity. Yeah. And of course, uh, SRE is something that God has blessed us with in New South Wales. It's not something that is undertaken all around our country or all around the world so it really is a privilege mm. to have these opportunities mm. to get in and, and mm. share the gospel with the kids mm. but Sue maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you've seen God at work in this ministry. Okay um, well as a team we're very aware of God enabling us to be there 
and uh, helping us through the sessions and all that and we've been learning from each other even though we're teaching the kids we're certainly learning from each other and we learn from the kids as well so that's always encouraging uh, we laugh at ourselves because um, we uh, couldn't find the mouse one day connected to the, the laptop which connects to the smart board and you can't need the mouse to make it all work we looked high and low for this mouse where was the mouse? The mouse was on the floor. And of course, where else would you find a mouse but on the floor? So <laughs> we just, yeah, learn to laugh at ourselves. And sometimes we think we get smart with the smart board, but then God puts us in our place and we start again. So it's all good. Um, the students uh, really like to sing um, and they're quite good at it, actually. And we sing a lot of Colin Buchanan's music, so that's gospel based so that's good they're learning the scriptures through song uh, when we have a revision and, and quiz game uh, we're very encouraged of how the knowledge is on the bible so that's a great encouragement and, and a blessing and um, last year our boy and girl captain uh, came to scripture and and that was uh, uh, i found really encouraging so we encourage them in their role model positions and encourage them and invited them into the class uh, with Bible reading and prayer and the same with our, our Easter assembly. And um, yeah, it was, it was, I found it really encouraging that the captains attended scripture. And Jacob actually come up through scripture from kindergarten to year six. So that was, yeah, it was beautiful, yeah. it was beautiful. Um, some of their kids, are, as Bessie has said, that um, uh, speak to us about their personal life and they come to us uh, and talk to us about it, um, looking for comfort and prayer support. So, yeah, God's working wonderfully. And what a privilege to be part yeah, of that. It's all yeah, wonderful. Some of the things, you know, really tugs at the heart, but yeah, yeah. we do our best. Thanks, Sue. Mm -hmm. Um, Bessie, can you maybe tell our NBC family how they can be helping, support and maybe be involved in this ministry yeah, as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, so we have to follow the Department of Education guidelines and especially at the moment with COVID, um, if any of us are sick, we are not allowed or able to go into the classrooms, mm -hmm. um, which will leave us short of volunteers and helpers. Um, so if anyone is interested in going on our reserve list, um, that would be really helpful. So speak to one of us and we can point you in the right direction. Um, but also people could just be in prayer about um, helping in, on the team uh, every week, just being one of our scripture teachers. Um, and if you're even just intrigued about what we do, uh, please contact one of us and talk mm -hmm. to us. We'd love to share with you the enjoyment and fun that we get out of teaching scripture. Mm -hmm. Some of us for shorter times, but still it's great. <laughs> yeah. And it, it certainly is a wonderful opportunity. And if, if anyone is interested even in hearing more or perhaps joining the team, I, I encourage you as well, speak to, speak to one of these ladies or, or come and speak to me. We'd be delighted to, to facilitate that. It, it really is a wonderful, wonderful ministry. And I guess that the final question, something that everyone can be doing is praying. Yes. So, so how, how can we be praying as a church mm. for this ministry? So I just want to um, thank and praise God and uh, for the ministry that we do have in our schools because it is a great privilege and it's an opportunity. So I always pray and thank God for these opportunities and, um, and for the kids' Bible knowledge. And there's a lot of people in our church that um, pray regularly for, for this ministry. So that's always a, a big thank you to God for their faithfulness too. Uh, please pray for wisdom as uh, we listen to the kids and answer their questions and with their personal life to be sensitive and caring. Um, pray for, for good health and strength for, for all of us, teachers and the school, the kids, their families and yeah, just very thankful and, and maybe having a, a couple of people step up for the team. So. Thank you. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, we can certainly be committing all those things to prayer and we will be praying in just a moment. 
Um, but until then, thank you both for making the effort to come and join us here. And thank I know you. everyone will be encouraged to have heard this. And everyone at home, let me urge you to please be in prayer for this great ministry. God bless and we'll see you all soon. Hi, Judge family, it's Sam here. Um, I'll be doing the prayer this morning. And just to start off, I'll be reading from uh, Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will exalt the Lord with all my heart in the council of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the words of the Lord. They are pondered by all who delight in them. Glorious and majestic are his deeds and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever, enacted in faithfulness and upright, uprightness. He provides redemption for his people. His ordinance, his covenants, forever holy and awesome in, is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him, 
belongs eternal praise. Lord God, I just thank you uh, that we can meet together today. I just pray uh, as we uh, come to this time of uh, hearing your word that you will help us to be focused and uh, steadfast in it. Lord, in this time of hardship, uh, help us to stay focused on you at all times as you are in control. We thank you, Father, for the work and ministry of the SRE. We pray for smooth transition back into the schools and for additional volunteers to help. And most of all, we just pray that these children will be able to come to know Jesus. Please we be with our missionary families overseas. And Lord, we just pray that you will have uh, your hand over them in this time of change and in this time of unsure. Uh, we just pray that you will uh, keep them safe. Uh, we pray for our government uh, that you will make them uh, have wise decisions and just uh, consider all the, all the things that are happening and uh, may they uh, be uh, good in their decisions that they make. Lord, I pray for anyone who's ill, anyone who's stressed, anyone who has felt unsure in this time and I just pray that you will be have your hand over them and know and they will know your love and your grace. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to come back to church next week. And I just pray that uh, when we come back, uh, that we will really enjoy the fellowship together. Lord, I pray for those who are unable to come back to church. And I just pray that you will uh, let them know that they are loved and that they are cherished and that we will uh, enjoy their company when they do return. And Lord, I just thank you again for your son who died on the cross so that we can have a relationship with you. Be with us now as we uh, look into your word. Amen. Well, thanks, Sam, and hi there, everyone. It's fantastic to, to see the excitement in your voice as we look forward to gathering together again here in this place next week. I hope that you, like I, are really eagerly anticipating gathering together and having that face-to-face -face connection with the local body of Christ. It's going to be great, isn't it? Only seven days away now. In 2019, Time magazine awarded its Person of the Year to its youngest ever recipient, the 16-year-old Greta Thunberg. This Swedish schoolgirl became the worldwide face for action on climate change after first staging a strike outside the Swedish parliament and then embarking on a tireless communication campaign. Barely a day goes by where we don't hear about environmental issues these days, does it? Whether that be carbon levels, pollution, landfill, ecological sustainability. The conservation of the environment has moved from being a fringe issue to right at the very centre of public policy. A green Bible has even been published, highlighting not Jesus' words in red, but those passages that speak about the environment in green, seeking to, and I quote, highlight the rich and varied ways the books of the Bible speak directly to how we should think and act as we confront the environmental crisis facing our planet. But is that right? Does the Bible really speak directly as to where we should stand on such issues? Is there a distinctly Christian view of the environment? Well, that's the question we're going to be asking together today. Is God green? Now, let me say right at the start that it's very easy for all of us on a whole range of matters to be convinced that our particular view is the biblical one, when in fact it's been absorbed from a variety of different sources, maybe from our society, from our teachers, from our family. 
And so today what I pray we're going to do is let the Bible speak for itself. As we look at the origins of our environment, its condition now, and the fate that ultimately awaits. Let's start now where the scriptures do with the creation of the universe. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. You would have noticed that there wasn't a particular passage of the scriptures read before our sermon today. That's because we're going to be taking a big picture look today at the entire counsel of God's word. We're going to see what his word has to say right from its beginning to end about the environment. And we're going to start right at the beginning with Genesis chapter 1, where in verse 1 we read, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here in the opening verse of God's revelation to us, the scriptures, we see that God is eternal. He existed prior to creation and that the fruit of his labor, the created universe, is separate from him. Now that might seem obvious, but these opening words of the scripture affirming that God created our world lays an important, lays an important foundation for us. That creation is not God. Creation is not Mother Nature. That's pantheism, the view that all of life is one single, indivisible whole, that, that all things are divine, that they are all God. Now here we see that God and what he's created are distinct. And the world that he created, we're told, was good. That's the refrain we see again and again in the creation account, isn't it? And God saw that it was good. Culminating in this on the sixth day from verse 26. Please turn there with me now. Genesis 1 from verse 26. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule. That's a word we're going to come back to. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Another phrase we're going to come back to. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. It's here on the sixth day that God creates the climax of his creation, the only thing said to have been made in his image, humanity. Now, there's much to this designation, being made in the image of God. And we don't have time to unpack it all today. But we do need to see, friends, that humanity has a special relationship with God, a distinct place in the created order. As Ryan, said, as Ryan read in Psalm 8 at the start of our service today, we, we see that humans just aren't, more, aren't slightly more evolved plants or animals. No, humanity has been created just a little bit lower than the angels and the heavenly beings, crowned with glory and honour, made to rule over the works of God's hands. There's a uniqueness about being made in the image of God. And so, friends, 
as Bible-believing Christians, we must disagree with those who claim, informed by Darwin's theory of evolution, that humans are no different to any other animal. That's what Darwinianism claims, that humans and plants and animals are all part of the same evolutionary process and so are all equally worthy of existence. This is what one of the proponents of that view suggests. A human life has no more intrinsic value than an individual grizzly bear life. If it came down to a confrontation between a grizzly and a friend, I'm not sure whose side I would be on. But I do know humans are a disease, a cancer on nature. Now, not only would David be a very dodgy friend, particularly if you're being attacked by a grizzly bear, that's a claim which is also held, by the way, by Peter, people for the ethical treatment of animals. That is totally contrary to the Scriptures. Whilst it's good and right that we seek to protect and save the whales and the grizzly bears, we must push back on the claim that, they're of, that they are of equal value as humans. So, what should our relationship to creation be? Does the fact that we've been made in the image of God, tasked with ruling over the creative order, mean that we can basically treat the environment as we see fit with no regard for the consequences at all? Well, the answer, unsurprisingly to that question, is no. We just read in Genesis 1.28 that we're to fill the earth and subdue it, that we're to rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And in the very next chapter of the scriptures in Genesis chapter 2 the nature of this rule is fleshed out for us take a look with me if you will at Genesis chapter 2 from verse 15 Genesis 2 verse 15 the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it we're to work creation and take care of creation. To exercise dominion over creation without being destructive, without abusing, spoiling, or destroying creation need needlessly. We're to rule over creation to make it fruitful and productive, whilst always recognizing that the earth is the Lord's, not ours. We're stewards, caretakers, if you like, of God's creation. And generally speaking, that's what we see play out in our world, isn't it? We see in people's normal behaviour that these are truths that are written on every human heart. We have a worldwide fund for nature to protect the environment and wildlife. I don't know about you, but I've never been approached by an animal in a shopping centre seeking to fundraise to save the humans. Our world recognises that it's our God-given role to care for and nurture creation. God has made plants and animals according to their kinds. And it's our role to discern God's purpose for them and then to use and care for each sustainably. That means that it's okay to have a chicken kebab, but that we should care for the chicken well whilst it lives. That's why it's good to have a compost, pe compost heap at home to ensure that there's as little waste as possible going into landfill. The scriptures speak a lot about wisdom and it's wise for us to consider how to best rule and care for that which God has made. Because when we rule well, as those made in God's image, it's good for us and good for creation. But sadly, that ideal picture is far from the sin-marred reality of our world, isn't it? 
Because in Genesis chapter 3, we see humanity rebel against our Creator, the effects of which were both devastating and widespread. Please turn there with me now, Genesis chapter 3, where we'll read from verse 17. To Adam, he said, that's God, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Not only was our relationship with God ruptured in the fall, our relationship with the environment was also cursed. Humanity would no longer be in perfect sync with its environment. And one of the primary ways that sin has affected our relationship with the environment is seen in our self-interest. Let me give you an example from the Scriptures. In Exodus chapter 23, God promises to give Israel a bountiful and productive land, but commands them to let the land rest every seventh year. God commanded Israel to institute a system that cared for the environment, that allowed the land to rejuvenate and so be used sustainably. But the nation of Israel ignored this. And later on in 2 Chronicles, we're told they were punished for refusing to let God's land rest. And this same self-interest plays out in our world today too, doesn't it? In the mindless overconsumption of our society, exhausting natural resources without any regard for sustainability or for future generations, prioritising today and the maximisation of profit and comfort at the cost of tomorrow. My friends, selfishly exploiting creation like this is a denial of God's purposes for us. You know, it's ironic. Many unbelieving environmentalists warn us that we can't keep living like this, that our disregard for the air and the water and our climate will ultimately catch up with us. And although they don't believe the authority of God's Word, that's exactly what God's Word implies too. So, what's the solution? Do we all need to go out today and join Greenpeace? Well, as helpful as it might be, environmental activism only addresses the symptoms of our disease. It's a bit like the calamine lotion you put on when you've got chicken pox. It does a great job easing the itching and the scratching that you experience, but ultimately it doesn't address the virus that's running around in your system, does it? And it's exactly the same here. Ultimately, it's the consequences of sin, the consequences of the curse that need to be addressed, that need to be reversed. And in Colossians chapter 1, we come to God's solution. Please turn there with me in your Bibles now to Colossians chapter 1, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to, the, to a church in the New Testament. Colossians chapter 1, where we'll read from verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. 
and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Here's the solution, friends. God created, holds together, and reconciles all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross to reconcile sinners to God. But we see here in verse 20 that this reconciliation is much broader than that. Through Christ, all things are reconciled to God. Paul uses the phrase, the phrase all things, five times here, each time referring to the created universe. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus died on the cross to save trees or chickens from their sins, but that on the last day, when Jesus returns and the full consequences of his death and resurrection are made known, creation will be restored, renewed and at peace. Friends, Jesus' resurrection brings about cosmic restoration and renewal of creation. Humanity will be restored, not just to God and each other, but to creation as well. This doesn't mean, though, that there's nothing for us to do now. A bit later on in Colossians, in chapter 3, Paul tells us, from Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Since then you have been raised with Christ, Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Whilst we wait for the day when Jesus returns and creation is restored, we're to set our hearts on things above. That doesn't mean that we're only to think about heaven, but that we're to align our hearts and our minds with God's. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Friends, we become part of the new creation now when we come to Christ. And so we're to live in this world now as citizens of the world to come putting our self-centred desires to death and aligning ourselves with God's original plan for humanity. The realities of eternity, of God's purposes, reshaping our lives now. Living the resurrection life in the here and now. Living first fruits, if you like, a foretaste of the renewed world to come. And so we're to love our neighbours as ourselves. And we love our neighbour well when we seek to ensure that the environment can meet their needs. Lobbying our government to protect the environment is loving our neighbour well. We love our neighbours well, not those who live just next door but elsewhere on this planet, when we seek to protect them from the potentially catastrophic effects of rising sea levels. We're to love our neighbour well. One of the things I think you sometimes hear from Christians is that because they disbelieve climate science data, for example, that there's no need to worry about the environment, that we can dis disregard any environmental concerns because we don't believe the data. 
same saying that we need more or better data before taking action, that things aren't as bad as the, as the media might portray. Now let me say, I don't have an opinion on that, and that's because I don't think it matters. I actually don't think that matters at all. The Scriptures call on us to be wise stewards of creation, no matter what its condition. We're called in the Scriptures to exercise wise dominion over creation, not as a form of crisis management when things get bad, but as a way of life. We're called to care for and steward creation well, whether it's degraded, whether it's in a stable condition, or whether it's improving. Nor, let me say, does the fact that some radical environmentalists have hidden political agendas obliterate God's commands to us. Now, we do need to be aware of hidden worldviews, no doubt, so that we can ensure that we don't get caught up in them. But their presence doesn't mean ignoring God's commands either. To do that would be like refusing to pay tax because you don't like how the government's going to spend it. Our first responsibility is to obey the command of God, whether it comes to paying taxes or caring for his world. Friends, we need to guard against extremes when thinking about the environment. We need to guard against thinking that the environment is all that matters, directing all of our time and energy into something which is ultimately going to pass away. That's effectively worshipping creation, not the creator, isn't it? But we also need to guard against thinking that the physical world doesn't matter at all, because God's word clearly says that it does. Brothers and sisters, it's this tension. This tension is why, for us as believers, environmental action must always be accompanied by evangelism. We can make a valuable contribution to our world. But unless we're sharing the gospel of Jesus as we do so, our efforts will ultimately prove to be eternally fruitless. The greatest need that our world has isn't more compost bins or green space. It's Jesus. Our concern for people must be greater, must be greater than our concern for creation. In Genesis chapter 8, after the flood, God promises that he will sustain the life-giving cycles of this world as long as it endures. Seasons, planting and harvesting, night and day, they will continue as long as the earth endures. Our focus must be to see people recreated in Christ. And so we must proclaim Christ in the here and now. Because, my friends... Ultimately, only that which is entrusted to Christ will last. Environmental activists are right. This world is doomed to destruction, but not because of carbon gases. Please turn with me, if you will, to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, where we'll read from verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. This world, cursed and infected by sin, will be destroyed by a deliberate act of its creator. We don't need to worry. It's not going to happen inadvertently. Judgment will come by the creator God. Let's keep reading from verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, 
The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. Sin has so corrupted, so poisoned this world that the only solution is destruction. This world is reserved for fire. Environmental activists are right on that one. This world won't last forever. But whilst the destruction of this earth is very real and coming, that isn't the final picture we're left with in the Scriptures. That's one of recreation. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21, to the second last chapter of the Scriptures. Revelation chapter 21, and we'll read from verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Recreation follows judgment. A redeemed, renewed, new creation, untarnished by sin and decay is coming, where God himself will dwell with his people. Turn with me to Revelation 22, just to the very next chapter. And we're going to read again from verse 1. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Friends, do you see that this new creation isn't dissimilar to the old? It's the perfection of creation. The tree of life is there, but there's no curse. God's people reigning with him forever. In a city, though it's not a city made of concrete and steel, it's a garden city with the river of life flowing down its centre. Redeemed humanity living in harmony with its environment. The fulfilment of God's original purposes back in Genesis chapter 1. Friends, the new creation is just that, a new creation. The future that we as believers have waiting for us doesn't mean we're sitting on clouds playing harps. No, we'll enjoy an embodied physical existence in the new creation, where the image of God will be restored where we'll be engaged in joyful dominion. Yes, there will be work in heaven. Where we'll care for the world perfectly, with no curse, no death, no sin. 
the Bible both begins and ends with God dwelling with his people, overseeing the wise stewardship of creation. You know, although I suspect she doesn't know it, Greta Thunberg's hopes for a new world, one where the environment is stewarded wisely, that's whole again, is the hope of the gospel. A world made new. A world, though, that won't be ushered in by Greta Thunberg, nor by environmental activism, but by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That day that she's longing for. The day of peace and recreation is the day that we should work for and yearn for too as our Lord comes again. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that often we are nothing if not poor stewards of the creation that you have entrusted to us. Lord, we confess that often self-interest and overconsumption characterizes our lives, that we look to our own interests rather than the interests of those around us and the generations to come. Lord, we pray that you might help us to live as new creatures, as citizens of the eternal city in this world now. We pray that in this, in our view of the environment and its care, like in all things, that you might reshape our minds, that you might align our hearts with yours. May the truth of the scriptures and the hope of eternity with you drive and transform our lives now. Lord, as we seek to wisely steward and exercise dominion over your creation, we pray that you might help us to never neglect the gospel. Ultimately, Lord, it is our heart's desire that all people, that all of the elect come to enjoy the new creation in eternity, the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. Lord, please use us, we pray, to share the hope of the gospel with this world that so needs to hear it. This world is passing away, Lord. We have seen that ever so clearly in the last few days. We have been reminded of the weakness of this world. Lord, help us to long for eternity and to share Jesus as we go. We pray this in his name. Amen. Well, friends, as we draw our service to a close now, we're going to do so by singing, I trust, with full hearts and voices the great hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King. It's a sovereign grace adaptation. And in the final verse, this is what we're going to proclaim. He shall return in power to reign. Heaven and earth, all creation, will join to say, O oh, praise him, alleluia. Then who shall fall on bended knee? All creatures of our God and King. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. Hallelujah. Let's sing now, and I'm looking forward to seeing you face to face next week.
Thank you for being with us today, brothers and sisters. I trust that you, like me, have been encouraged by God's Word. You've also had your minds and hearts stirred as we've thought about the God of all creation, how we are to rule and tend creation, and ultimately how we will see all creation restored into the right state, glorifying God more fully in the future, something that we should all be anticipating, longing for, and striving towards, even as we evangelize this world through this means. Uh, let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, throughout this week, be praying in preparation as we return to physical gatherings next week. In the evenings, we're going to be resuming our series in Romans and continue on through the rest of that great book. And in the mornings, we'll be commencing a series looking at the I Am statements of Jesus found in the Gospel of John. So that is something also to look forward to. To close our time, though, let me ask you to join with me once more in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Lord, our Heavenly Father, we do again praise you for who you are, the creator, sustainer of all things, the one in whom Christ has been appointed head and firstborn over all creation. Lord, we ask that you would enable us as your people to live and rule in your world well in a way that honors you and reflects your glory. And may you stir in us an anticipation, not only for the coming days as we gather together, but for that future state where all things will be restored to their perfection and all things will glorify you eternally. We ask that as we look forward to that day, you would use us in this present place well. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, we're eagerly looking forward to next week where we'll see you all here at our services. Until then, may God bless and keep you. And we'll see you then.